Um, I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party in Birmingham, and I'm going to be chairing the session today um, on Do We Only Want Allies, Marxism and Identity Politics. Our speaker, Tomash, is um, one of uh, the chairs of the LGBT caucus in the Socialist Workers' Party. He'll be speaking for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have time for discussion, um, and then Tomash will come back to answer any questions. So I'll hand over to you. Uh, Brill, uh, thanks, uh, thanks all for coming. I think everyone can hear me, can't they? Lovely. Um, well, I want to start by saying that you know, in the last um, five years or so, we've seen hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, uh, mobilised against various uh, forms of oppression. You know, just since January, uh, we saw protests taking place right from the Scottish Islands and Highlands to London after Rishi Sunak blocked uh, the GRA reforms in Scotland. And then just the next month, you saw uh, mass vigils take place after the murder of uh, Brianna Jai. And I think it's broader than just LGBT plus oppression and trans and non-binary uh, oppression in particular. You also saw uh, the upsurge against sexism after the murder of Sarah Everett against the police. And also uh, Black Lives Matter explode onto the, uh, uh, onto the streets. And I think one of the things within all those struggles is that uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are not directly affected by uh, their, that particular oppression have also mobilised and want to be part of those different uh, a part of those different struggles. Um, uh, I'm going to focus on LGBT plus oppression, but I think a lot of the kind of uh, comments that I'll make can be applied to um, other forms of uh, other forms of oppression as well. And I think there's two questions which have come up in these various uh, movements. Um, one is, how effective is uh, a politics uh, based on identity, i.e. mobilising around a shared identity, effective in terms of winning uh, liberation? Uh, what are its strengths and weaknesses? And second of all, is a question around allyship. And is it good enough as a way of involving people who aren't directly affected by a particular oppression in those different uh, struggles uh, that are taking place? And I want to think about this by looking at um, uh, some key turning points in LGBT plus history, in particular um, the Stonewall riots and the gay liberation front of the 1960s and 70s. And the, the reason for that is, uh, first of all, it was the birth of the kind of modern movement for gay liberation. But also I think a lot of the arguments around identity politics and our allyship obviously took place in a different context, perhaps in, using different language, but actually were quite similar. I think we should learn from those kind of struggles to, to, answer, uh, the, to answer those questions. I think the first thing uh, I want to say about identity politics is that it is a major kind of um, scapegoat used by the right. And when the right use identity politics, essentially what they mean is we want LGBT plus people, we want trans people, we want black people to shut up and get back in their box. And therefore, I think we have to start with um, a, a point of solidarity and pointing to the kind of real and substantial strengths of mobilising around on the basis of a shared identity. And I think some people, even on the left, get that wrong, where they sort of say identity politics is in some way, or questions of identity are a distraction from, you know, so-called class issues, you know, it is trans rights that's, that divides the strikes and class struggle, when in reality it's transphobia which divides working class people, or, you know, when they say, or when they, or when they say that you know, anti-racism um, divide, uh, you know, div is divisive to the movement, we should just talk about wages and so on, well it's actually racism which is uh, dividing working, working class people, and I think that has to be the sort of starting point, and there's a difference between the identity politics of the right and the left. You know, the right try and mobilise people on the basis of identity to, in defence of, you know, white, heterosexual, uh, male identity, and so, quote-unquote. Um, and, you know, that's a difference, that's, that, that's hugely different to when oppressed people mobilise on the basis of a shared identity. That's a response to oppression. What the right wing try and do is to actually corral working class people behind a right wing agenda by saying, you're being attacked as a white person, you're being attacked as a straight person, and you need to, you need to mobilise on that basis against, uh, against trans rights, non-binary rights, uh, LGBT plus people, um, uh, and so on. So uh, I think when it comes to identity politics, at its most basic level, it means organizing around a shared identity. And the movements of the 1960s and 70s, uh, Gay Liberation Front, Black Power, the women's liberation movements are important examples. And I want to, sorry if you, maybe you have to pan the camera, sorry. Um, 
look at the Stoma beginning of, of sort of the, the, the modern sort of gay liberation movement around uh, the Stonewall riots of 1969. Um, what happened in uh, Stonewall is that the police were attacking the Stonewall Inn, and obviously this had taken place many times before, but on that night of the, um, of the 27th of June of that year, people fight back against the, um, fight back against the cops. And um, out of that movement, you have um, the Gay Liberation Front. Uh, the Gay Liberation Front is born. Uh, in New York, but quickly, similar organizations are set up in Canada, France, Austria, Germany, Italy, Belgium, uh, Holland, and Britain. And I think the politics that came before this was really what, what people would call an assimilationist politics, tr trying to appeal to the respectability uh, of, of, um, of, of society and say, we will not upset the norms of the church, the family, and the state the kind of the homophile movement or the Daughters of Belitis, which is the main kind of lesbian organization in the US. And Stonewall changes everything. And it changes the lives of every single uh, LGBT plus person uh, in the world. And it's a movement that takes place uh, against the backdrop of a broader revolt, but also uh, on the campuses, the anti-war movements. But also it's a movement made up of um, many black, Latinx people. This is how the historian John D'Amelio described the Stonewall riots. Graffiti calling for gay power had appeared along Christopher Street. Knots of youth gathered on the corners, angry and restless. Someone had heaved a sack of wet garbage through the window of a police patrol car. And on nearby Waverley Place, a concrete block landed on the hood of another cop car that was quickly surrounded by dozens of men pounding its doors and dancing on its hood. Trash fires blazed, bottles and stones flew through the air, and cries of gay power rang in the streets as police numbering 400 did battle with a crowd estimated at 2,000. And that's how the gay liberation movement was born, in a riot against the police. Martha Shelley was one of the leading uh, members of the Gay Liberation Front in New York, and she wrote Gay is Good in 1970. And uh, this is what she had to say up on the slide. Look out, straights. Here comes the Gay Liberation Front springing up like warts all over the bland face of America. It's causing shudders of indignation in the delicately balanced bowels of the movement. Here come the gays, marching with six-foot banners to Washington and embarrassing the liberals. We are shaking off the chains of self-hatred and marching on your citadels of repression. Um, and I think that shows some of the power about organizing around a shared identity. First of all, I want to focus on the bit where she talks about shaking off the chains of self-hatred. So I think if you think about how oppression works, it often makes people feel as if they're inadequate, as if they, what they have to say doesn't really count. It saps people of their confidence. And when people come together, all those individual experiences can be collectivized and can actually give people um, strength to fight back and a confidence to fight back. And I think that's partly what the Gay Liberation Front did. It had took all those kind of experiences and allowed people through coming together to gain a self-confidence to fight back. The second strength, I think, is when it says marching on the citadels of repression. Now, there, weren't, there wasn't a sort of a set view on what those citadels of repression were, and I'm going to come on to, uh, and I'm going to come on to some of the debates that, um, that, that took place. But the GLF did call itself a revolutionary movement. It wanted to get rid of what it called the system. Again, debates about what that system, uh, about what that system is. And it wasn't just kind of focused on winning equal rights with kind of straight people within the confines of uh, of uh, society. This is another. Sorry, I'm really annoying Jonathan here by planning. Um, this is another kind of a leading figure within the GLF. I'm going to come back to around allyship. It's Carl Whitman writes the Gay Manifesto in 1970. Whitman had been part of the different struggles within the Students for a Democratic Society and the anti-war movements, had co-authored uh, a pamphlet called for an interracial movement of the poor in the early 1960s, and again writes, you know, liberation for gay people is defining for ourselves uh, how and with whom we live, instead of measuring our relationships in comparison to straight ones and straight values. We have to define for ourselves a pluralistic and role-free social structure for ourselves. 
Um, it must contain both the freedom and physical space for people to live alone, live together for a while, live together for a long time, either as couples or in large numbers, and the ability to flow easily from one of these states to another uh, as our needs change. And again, that's sort of saying we don't want just legal reforms within the system. We're talking about trying to challenge the very social structures uh, within uh, within society. And I think, again, you can see how, how powerful that was. However, whilst the Gay Liberation Front um, was radical, it did shake the system, it did try to link up with other struggles. You know, think about its name, where does the Gay Liberation Front name come from? It's a nod to the National Liberation Fronts of Vietnam and Algeria. It worked with the Black Panthers and what about one support from them for, uh, for, uh, for gay rights and other sort of movements at the time. But whilst these movements could kind of shake the state and the system, they weren't actually able to break the state and to break capital and the system that was perpetuating these sort of uh, oppressions. And here I want to kind of talk about some of the limits of identity politics, uh, also within kind of this historical context, but then think about how that applies uh, today. And I think there's two kind, of, um, two kind of questions. One is, what's the strategy to win liberation, which I think identity politics does leave open. You know, simply organizing around a shared identity um, doesn't mean that there's a set strategy. You know, does it mean looking towards the social power of the working class? Does it mean um, separatist organization? Does it mean a focus on autonomy with it, with, of different struggles? Uh, or does it mean trying to unite those different struggles into a much bigger, uh, into a much bigger movement? And the second kind of weakness is a question of, you know, who's in and who's out, and a danger of uh, of fragmentation. So that's a GLF uh, kissing in Trafalgar. Uh, this, uh, uh, who's in and who's out, the kind of danger of fragmentation. And on the first one, I think you can see some of those debates that took place at the time. This is um, Come Together, which is um, the, sort of the magazine of the gay liberation movement in Britain in the early 1970s. And uh, these are uh, two, of the, two of the issues. On the cover here and here, you can see they're talking about mobilizing against what was then the Industrial Relations Bill. The Tory government was pushing through um, a, an attack on union rights. And uh, some people within the GLF in Britain sought to kind of mobilize on those demonstrations, actually challenged some of the ideas of the people, people of those working class people who were striking and protesting against this attack on union rights, and sought to try and win them over um, uh, in a common struggle. And there's quite some quite good interviews, which I don't have time to go into, of people saying how their ideas began to be challenged, uh, be, be challenged uh, by this. In the, in the same magazine, the same issue of that magazine, there's, uh, there's a letters page which talks in quite kind of a hard way about how straight people themselves are the problem and can't be won over. And therefore, they don't really have any kind of place in the movement. And therefore, it's not really possible to do that. So you can see how very contradictory sets of you know, politics were kind of uh, uh, within the same, uh, same uh, organisation. And, uh, you know, when you talk about organizing around identity, I think it's very important to listen to people's experiences, to see how, you know, what they want to do in, t in terms of the fight against uh, 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 oppression. But often I think sometimes identity politics and uh, concepts around allyship can actually essentialize people um, uh, to, to, to an extent. You know, we need to listen to LGBT plus people. Well, there are many different LGBT plus people with many different ideas and experiences about how to organize and different sets of politics um, in terms of taking that movement, uh, in terms of taking that movement uh, forward. And, you know, within the GLF, there was a long running argument about safe versus radical. You know, could you kind of include tr what we would now call trans and non-binary people within the movement? Or was that going to put off the, f you know, winning kind of, you know, support from people in power because we're not respectable, we've just got to try and win equal, uh, 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 equal rights and so on. A kind of more of a focus on lifestyle politics rather than political action and that you could change society by the, you know, living in communes rather than action on the streets and in the workplaces and so on. And these sort of, um, uh, and these sort of debates. And I think partly as a result of the broader revolts of the, of the time not breaking through, you see a fragmentation which takes place. And really the question is kind of, um, you know, who's in and who's out? And I think this sort of politics fuels quite a, quite a hardcore um, ideas of autonomy and separatism, which really say, why work with people who are actually the oppressor? 
Now, you know, we went through the first session about saying, look, oppression is rooted in the system, and that shapes people's behaviors and their attitudes and their ideas, but it's not some, um, you know, just straight people who are, the, who are actually the root cause of that oppression, but many people thought that, uh, thought that, you know, quite understandably, because that's, the, 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 there was their, that was their experience. But this leads to kind of a quite a hardcore autonomy and separatism, and also then, um, the movement breaking down into different sort of identities. So the GLF splits, this was a woman identified woman, which is that the lesbian, uh, le lesbian group splits off from the GLF. And I think this also pointed to problems around how the movement dealt with often what were real problems. You know, within the movements of the 60s, you did have people who were sexist, who had sexist ideas, who had racist ideas and so on. But you could see one version of trying to challenge that was to work, keep working together but actually be really hard about you know, taking those ideas on. You know, it wasn't automatic that the Black Panthers supported the Gay Liberation Front. That took some hard arguments and, you know, com and conversations to take place, but they won that support. An alternative uh, way of doing it is to say, okay, well, these, there's a problem with some of these people's ideas, therefore we're gonna split off into our own little group and, we, and not, really work, not really work together anymore. And really what you get is a sort of fragmentation into ever, ever smaller kind of identities and, uh, and uh, uh, taking place throughout that period. So there's splits amongst, uh, in, with it, among gay men between drag queens and what were called machos. Uh, there was a split amongst uh, political and non-political lesbians because there was considered non-political lesbians were still part of the gay bar scene, and therefore they were kind of colluding with men uh, in, 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 in that oppression. And really the emphasis on autonomy leads to kind of a, a focus on the individual rather than the collective as a means of winning liberation uh, uh, during that period. And by the end of the 1970s, there's a kind of atmosphere of blame, recrimination, and really it's about trying to get your slice of the pie rather than getting rid of the rotten pie altogether. And I think when you look at the politics today, it's not as extreme as the, those sort of arguments and fragmentation that took place, but you can see how those dangers still are there with, uh, with movements that base themselves just around identity politics. Often I think the kind of politics today is a more, more inclusive identity politics where people see themselves as part of kind of connected but separate struggles that are taking place. Um, but nonetheless, you can still see, uh, I think you can still see, that, uh, still see that taking place today. And I want to come along to uh, uh, now the kind of idea of what is the root cause really, I think, of the limits of identity politics and then think about um, think about um, allyship. And my next slide. Uh, why then? So that's Creston Dick, uh, who was the uh, commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, a deeply homophobic, sexist, racist organisation, uh, and one of the you know top kind of lesbian women in a position of power uh, within Britain. And the point I want to make here is that look, oppression cuts across class. Um, you, you can be in the ruling class and face um, homophobia and transphobia. And as socialists, we have to stand against oppression, against whomever is uh, directed, and whoever actually, you know, perpetuates it. Um, you know, I will stand with a ruling class trans person if they're facing transphobia from a working class person and challenge those ideas. And that's, uh, uh, and that's, incredibly, um, and that's incredibly important. But I think as socialists, we also have to understand the importance of class in terms of shaping, uh, shaping oppression and also the relationship between exploitation and oppression. And why is it that we, that we look at this? First of all, I think you know, class is partly because class shapes how people experience oppression. There is a vast difference between being a working class trans woman and being Caitlyn Jenner, just in terms of access to you know, healthcare, security, and all the rest of it. And it's a, it shapes that sort of oppression and how people face it. But also, I think more fundamentally in some ways, it's not enough to talk about the unity of LGBT plus people around a shared identity to actually overcome oppression. And why is this? So you know, we have our friend here, Cressida, uh, Cressida Dick, is the head of the, was the head of the Metropolitan Police Force. You know, has she faced sexism and homophobia? Yes, absolutely. You could not be in that institution and not face, uh, uh, not face those uh, sort of oppressions. Did, you know, does she abhor it on some level? Yeah, probably. She probably thinks, God, that's, that's, not, that's not, you know, jolly good, and so on. <laughs> However, and we should maybe have some review into doing something. Yeah, okay, sure. She, she think that. However, 
because of her class position in society, means that she has an interest, a class interest, in maintaining the system that perpetuates that oppression. And that's not a, you know, an abstract question. Think about the vigil um, after Sarah Everett's murder, you know, where you saw uh, hundreds, thousands of men and women come out together to protest against sexism, and they face brutal repression by a police force headed by a lesbian woman on the orders of a black uh, woman home secretary. So if you, if you think about it, why were they doing that? It's because they're in the ruling class and they have an interest in actually in, in, in perpetuating that system. They might want kind of legal reforms and you know better attitudes in society and think you know sexist ideas. You know we need to we need to do something about that. But they're not going to fundamentally uh, challenge um, uh, challenge uh, uh, challenge those sort of things. And I think that sort of politics, uh, you know, that can be a problem. You know when. When there were calls for Cressida Dick to resign after that vigil, there were some in the movement who said, well, actually, a, a lesbian woman st stepping down as head of the Met would be a step backwards for women and LGBT plus people because it would lead to less representation. So you can see how a strategy or a vision of the world simply based around shared identity can actually lead to serious, uh, serious uh, uh, problems. And I think in opposition to that, it's sort of in opposition to that, I want to put forward a kind of a Marxist strategy for, for liberation. And first of all, it's about seeing a kind of the centrality of class and the importance of class. Now, why is this? Um, five minutes, I might be going slightly over. Um, first, uh, first of all, I think it's about seeing that oppression isn't natural. You know, it hasn't always existed. Uh, and, it, uh, and it's born out of and rooted in capitalist and class society. And secondly, if oppression flows from that system of capitalism and class society, we have to ask, what is the social force that has the power to actually uproot that system? Um, and I would argue that that's the working class. And by the working class, I don't, I, you know, there's all sorts of you know, stupid ideas about what class means when you look at the kind of the liberal conceptions of it and so on. Basically, if you have to sell your ability to work, to make a living, you're working class if you do not own and control the stuff that makes other stuff, right? If you own and control the means of production, uh, then you're ruling class. And I think within the system, because working class people are the source of profits, so are the source of keeping society going, think about the strikes, think about, think about the pandemic, who was it that kept society going, and so on. That means if they organize collectively and withdraw their labor, they have a potential, and I mean potential power, to get rid of the system that is the root cause of our oppression. Now, there's nothing automatic about that, but we don't look to the working, say, the working class holds the keys to liberation because people have automatically better ideas or progressive ideas or socialist ideas. Those have to be fought for, um, but nonetheless, that potential power, uh, that potential power um, exists within uh, within um, uh, uh, within society. And I think that's a big part of the argument why organising right identity isn't enough. You actually have to look to a class-based uh, class-based strategy. Of, uh, of doing that. Here I kind of want to think about the kind of, well, what's the role then of people, working class people, who are not directly affected by a particular oppression within the movement? And I think this is where kind of allies, uh, uh, the ideas of allyship really come in. And I think, again, we have to have a starting point which says millions of people who are not LGBT+, plus, uh, who aren't black and so on, want to be part of struggles against oppression. And this is a good thing. We need a much bigger movement in order to take on the system and the scale of forces that, are, that, that, we're, that we're lined up against within the ruling class. And if something builds that movement, that's a good thing. And I think allyship is the kind of dominant way which those kind of ideas have been, uh, have been, um, have been expressed. And you look at kind of allyship guides, which are, and you know, a lot of the things I think are just you know, common sense in terms, in terms of things we would agree with. You need to listen to people's experiences. You need to reflect on your own behavior and challenge prejudices that you might have and so on. And those things, I think, are really, um, are really important. But part of the ideas, I think, that also feed into it is a sort of, uh, often based around various sets of what we would call kind of privilege theory. And again, I think we have to kind of be careful around how we, how we argue around this. But essentially, privilege theory says that oppression operates at the level of sort of a series of you know, unearned uh, benefits. And of course, there are massive, um, uh, move my slides on. There are massive differences in terms of how, um, in terms of how people um, 
experience oppression. Sorry, uh, in terms of how uh, people experience uh, oppression, and also in terms of their you know life's chances, in terms of access to healthcare, in terms of be, you know their experiences with the police and so on, and in terms of how that impacts on your you know socio-economic uh, position within society, and that's all true and real. What I think we have to do though is dig beneath the interpersonal relations and understand what's what these interpersonal relations are rooted in and if we kind of dig beneath that and think about okay those are the product of how oppression is rooted in capitalism and class society it's not actually straight white male working class people who are the beneficiaries of those different sort of disadvantages because those disadvantages flow from a system which ultimately benefits people at the top. And therefore, I don't think it's true that all straight people or all cis people are to blame or benefit from a society where you have LGBT plus and trans and non-binary oppression. I think the actual beneficiaries of that are the people at the top who use oppression in order to divide working class people. And I think this comes to another point where I think sometimes around allyship, often, you know, it's around giving people kind of like a moral plea. You should be against this oppression because it's a bad thing and it impacts on people. And look, we are against oppression because it's a bad thing, right? But oppression also serves a function for the ruling class to divide working class people. And therefore, I think if you're working class and you don't, uh, uh, don't uh, you know, you're straight or you're cis, um, I think you still have a material interest in getting rid of the system that causes that oppression and exploitation uh, uh, and exploitation altogether. And therefore, I think we need to go beyond the politics of simply allyship. And I think there's a, there's a couple of things I want to, examples I'm going to look at before I'm told to stop. One of those is around a sort of what we could call uh, a politics of uh, coalition. And there are many people who put forward these arguments. This is actually Carl Whitman, who was one of the leading members of the GLF, uh, again mentioned earlier. And in the Gay Manifesto, he says, look, the bulk of our work right now has to be organizing amongst ourselves. Basically, we have a gay, straight vision of the world, but not every straight is our enemy. Many of us have mixed identities and have ties with other liberation movements, women, blacks, other minorities. And face it, we can't change America alone. And really what he was saying is that we should build a coalition of different groups, thank you, of different groups, you know, and who do we look for? Women's liberation, black liberation, um, the Latinx people, white radicals, and so on. And I think that there's a power to that, uh, the, the idea that these groups have a mutual interest in getting rid of the system, but I think it doesn't go actually far enough. And you have to say, it's not just about a coalition of different oppressed people, we have to uh, have the idea that working class people who are straight, who are uh, white, who are male, can also be one round to, 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 the, to, to the fight for liberation. That's not automatic, it takes a big struggle, but that can happen. And I'm not blaming you know, someone like Whitman for not seeing that, because you know, why, would you, why would you think that, right, in terms of the experiences? But you can see another example, and this is where I'll stop, is this was during the 1980s, lesbians and gays support the minors. Who, who was a titanic struggle against the Tory, uh, against the Tory government, and they had a pits and perverts um, their concert, and one of the leading miners, Nidorovan, gets up and he says, "You have worn our badge, coal not dull, and you know what harassment means, as do we. Now we will pin your badge on us. We will support you. It will not change overnight, and I think that's important. It's not what you know." It's not, a, it's not a, it's a simple process, but now 140,000 miners know there are other causes and problems. We know about black people, we know about gay people, and nuclear disarmament, and we will never be the same. Again, I think you can see how the process of struggle you know, and solidarity, people can come to see that they have an interest in getting rid of that system. And you know, when people come into struggle, and this is an important point, you know, you can't, the ideas aren't going to be pure. You have to change them through that struggle, and we can't expect people to come at it from where we are, but we can be at the forefront of those struggles. And I think that's a much more positive vision of how a politics of solidarity can actually change things. And imagine, on a much bigger scale, in revolutionary struggles, how people's ideas could change. So I think, you know, identity politics can be a powerful mobilizer, but we have to go further around it a set of class politics, and allyship can broaden the movement, but actually it's not just about being allies, we need a politics of solidarity, which, which sees the need to win, working class people are not oppressed, into a struggle which is in their interest to get rid of that system.
today's meeting so far. Um, we have a festival at the end of June, beginning of July. It's a four day event full of lots and lots of amazing meetings, just like these ones you've been to. Um, we've got a really good line of speakers. You can see them in the, in the center of the leaf that should be on your table. We are currently having a um, early bird offer for students, which I think actually ends today. So if you sign up today, you get um, a cheap ticket, which obviously is great. Um, but yeah, it's a really, really good event. I'd really encourage people to come along to it and sign up. So those are all on your tables if you want to come. Uh, my next announcement is about Trans Pride, which is the 8th of July. Um, really encourage everybody to get down to it. It's Trafalgar Square, um, yeah, 8th of July. Again, leaflets on your table. And my final announcement, I mean, the comment at the back has kind of done the recruitment pitch for me, but I'd just like to reiterate, if you have enjoyed today so far and you agree with what, what we've said, then we'd really encourage you to think about joining us. Um, you can find red forms around the room. Um, you just have to fill in the back. And yeah, we'd really encourage you to, to join us in the social service party. But I will hand back over to Tom Ash now. So yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks for the great discussion, everyone. This is the part of the meeting where I try and get in everything that I didn't manage to get in <laughs> in the uh, in the lead off in uh, three broad points. Uh, just first of all, uh, on the questions around experience and collective action, and I think it's not the case of kind of either or that you have to begin with exper uh, begin with individual experience and that leads to collective action. I think there's often. Um, a, a relationship between the two. You know, Marxists sometimes talk about you know dialectics. It really means seeing things in relation to one another, and I think that's the way to look at individual experience and collective action. Because often experiences can be a spur towards taking collective action, but also the power of having a movement which seeks to amplify those things can actually encourage other people who have felt that way to actually do something about it. Um, and there's a good example in sort of in the 1980s, I think, where you know we talked about LGSM and the miners, and that led to the miners' union and then the trade union movement, and then eventually the you know, the Labour Party um, adopting a position of supporting gay rights. But there was another strike that took place in the 80s, which was the P&O ferries dispute, and within that you also saw solidarity between um, LGBT plus people and the P&O ferry workers, but what, what took place there is that actually encouraged some of the P&O workers to come out as gay themselves through that process. So you can see how actually these things, you know, you have to see these things in relation to one another. And I think that, that leads on to another important point which people have talked about is that, you know, when we talk about the working class, it's not a case of, you know, the working class is separate from oppressed groups. Um, the working class is the vast majority of people, not just in Britain, but across the world. It's the global majority now. At the time, you know, when Marx is writing with 8 to 10 million people or so, it's global majority. And it is straight, it is, uh, it, 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 it's LGBT+, plus, it's cis, as well as trans and non-binary, it's black, it is white. Uh, and you can see how, um, actually, when people fight back together as a class, it often encourages oppressed groups and makes them feel that they can that they can have that power, but also challenges the ideas of people within the working class who aren't directly oppressed on the basis of those sort of identities, uh, on the basis of those sort of identities uh, themselves. And therefore, I'm talking about trying to bring liberation politics in, into the working class movement and the kind of politics of class into liberation movements. It's about making an argument for the potential power that the working class as a whole has to actually take on the system that is the roots of our exploitation, but the roots of LGBT plus, uh, uh, LGBT plus oppression uh, as well. Uh, so I think that's, that's it's part of arguing for the strategy. Um, I think just I want to say one thing about this kind of the kind of differences of strategy that take place, because I think again, individual experiences are incredibly important, and I think as a movement you have to constantly reflect on how inclusive that movement is, on whether people who uh, you know are you know LGBT plus but also LGBT plus and black are the ways they experience oppression being taken up by the movement and so on, and I think that's important. Where I think some of the problems can come in is when people say, well, look, um, I'm LGBT+, and this is my strategy, and if you don't agree with it, you're essentially not taking oppression seriously. When in reality, you know, when I went to school, two of, the, two of my best friends at the time turned out to be incredibly gay 
t repress Tories, right? We have, I think we have pretty different ideas about how to change society, right? Um, however, that's you're not ignoring someone's kind of, you're not sort of silencing someone just because you disagree with them. And as a movement, we have to be respectful and inclusive, but also have open discussion about the way forward and not have discussions, discussions you know, shut down in that sort of way because that actually strengthens, uh, strengthens the movement uh, going forward. Um, the thing I want to say is just around kind of what our, what kind of our approach to trying to raise a class-based kind of strategy uh, is. And I think you know, it's important to say it's not about kind of finger-wagging at various movements. It's not to say, well, ah, you must understand that the potential power of the working class to change the world. One, because you're just not going to get anywhere. No one's going to listen to you at all. And also, I think, as revolutionary socialists, you have to prove that actually you take oppression seriously and that it's possible to break people who are, you know, white, cis, head, male, away from uh, oppressive ideas. And one of, the, um, one of the people that I think had quite good, good stuff to say about this was our... Sorry. <laughs> uh, one of the great revolutionaries of the 20th century, Leon Trotsky, that's Trotsky there with uh, Frida, uh, Frida Kahlo. And Trotsky was engaged in 1929 with um, a discussion with his American supporters. Trotsky had kind of stood up to the Stalinist counter-revolution in the Soviet Union and kind of buried the, the gains of, of LGBT plus oppression at the time. And he's arguing with a group of people in the US called the Oppositionists. They'd broken from the US Communist Party and we're trying to you know, put forward an anti-Stalinist uh, Stalinist, uh, Marxism. And Trotsky looks around at the, um, at the source of um, racism within even official trade union organizations right, within, uh, within, the, uh, within the United States. And you know, he's completely scathing about the kind of racism that black people face and the backward position of others on the left. And he says, you know, the trade union bureaucrats, like the bureaucrats of Stalinism, live in an atmosphere of aristocratic privilege. It will be a tragedy if the oppositionists are, inflected, are infected, even, this, even in the slightest degree, with these uh, prejudices. We must not only reject and condemn them, we must burn them from our consciousness to the last trace. And he adds that, quote, we must find the road to the most deprived of the working class, beginning with black people who must, quote, learn to see us as their revolutionary brothers. And he emphasizes that black people seeing socialists as their revolutionary brothers will, quote, depend wholly upon our energy and devotion to the work. In other words, that to actually win an argument for a class-based strategy, you have to obviously argue for class unity, you have to argue about the potential power of the working class, but you have to always be implacably opposed to oppression. And that, I think that sort of strategy that Trotsky puts forward there is actually something that informs our approach as the SWP. I'll give, I'm probably going to be told to sum up again, so I'll just give one last example. Think about trans pride in London. Uh, I know, for example, during the last couple of years, uh, Michael here, who's a member of the NEU Education Union, played a really important role getting trade union branches and banners along to trans pride. Now, why is that important? It's not just a sort of, you know, eyes and this good for show sort of thing. It's actually part of a process. Because when you go to your workplace and you raise an argument saying, we should support trans pride, we should support trans and non-binary rights, and we should also take a delegation down with our banner, it's part of putting an argument against oppression into a mixed workplace, into a, into a mixed uh, you know, working, class, um, working class organization. And that also then, when you take those banners on there and those delegations, that also is part of proving to people on Transparent, who might not necessarily think, okay, I working class themselves, but not see the pat see the you know the need for the potential power of the working class to say, okay, here actually is a social force which can be on our side. And I think that's utterly you know utterly crucial in that in that sense. So of course, you know, as revolutionaries you have to defend self-organization and the right of oppressed people to self-organize. But as a strategy, I don't think separatism and ideas of autonomy are actually enough to break the power of the people we're up against who have the money, who have the organization and so on. And therefore, we need that counter power. And therefore, I will end on, you know, I do think people should join the SWP because what we're trying to do is to group together all those people who want to fundamentally change 
uh, the society we live in, to get rid of exploitation and oppression, but to do that, we need to be organized because the ideas within the working class are contradictory. There are some people who can be really good on trans rights, but actually still be affected by racist ideas. There are people who can be anti-racist, but, 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 uh, but not support uh, trans rights. And therefore, we need, uh, I think you need to organize together as socialists on the basis of being part of all those movements and trying to win people, but also to put revolutionary arguments into them. And in every big struggle, there is a debate about whether you seek to confine your change to ch to within the system, or you seek to push forward and actually win. And to make the, sure we actually push forward and win much more, I think you need a revolutionary organization that takes seriously exploitation, takes seriously oppression, but then also tries to direct those struggles and weld them together around a spine of workers' power, which has the, which has the power to, to get rid of that system.